It is Friday, November the 30th, 2018. This is the Distant Peasant Podcast, and I am your host, Jeff in Georgia. On today's show, Mr. Taylor's Clockwork Min. Yes, that is the story of the founding of the science of modern business management. Yes, that's right, a systematic attempt to transform you, dear listener, from a human being, thinking, feeling, filled with hopes, dreams, fears, psychological contradictions and complications, and erasing them, making you an automaton. Of course, before we get to all that, just a brief reminder that the show, as always, is brought to you by listeners like you. Listeners who go to patreon.com slash dissident peasant. Thank you to each and every one of my recurring donors. Appreciate your support. Nobody puts me on a schedule but me. And I do suppose I am a couple days late. Sometimes it takes me a little bit of time to figure out what I'm going to do. And then yet more time, depending on the accessibility of the topic at hand, to gather what I think is rigorous information for you. And then, of course, a matter of just piecing it all together and making it sound nice to listen to. Piece of cake. Not really. So, if you want to support the making of those pieces of cake, to extend my metaphor ridiculously, of course you can go to patreon.com slash dissidentpeasant. There's of course a PayPal link at my website, dissidentpeasant.com, which is always headquarters. And thank you very much for your support and consideration, but most of all, just for listening. Shall I paint a scene for you? I shall. It's May 1911, and you are a laborer in one of the manufacturing buildings in Watertown, Massachusetts. Of course, we're deep into the second industrial revolution's machine tools, steel, electricity, and your job is basically to manufacture these huge gun and gun carriages. For the artillery of the day. In these days, you work directly for Uncle Sam, who doesn't actually exist yet, but no matter. But specifically, his armed forces. Two years prior, the lieutenant colonel, who held command of said arsenal, specifically reported your unit, the molders, those who shape liquid metal, using a pattern. He reported your output as extremely... Satisfactory. Your work is tough. But the pay could be worse. And as a bonus, you perhaps take some pride that you work directly for your country, that your labor and care goes into every finished piece, whose reliability is the difference between life and death, victory or defeat. You check your tools. They are dirty and dull. And as a person of pride, you go to renew them. As you do so, a man enters the factory floor, whom you have not seen before. He has a suit and a tie, clearly a college boy. And the foreman calls you all around, and it is explained that this man is something you haven't heard of before. A management consultant, an associate of a Mr. Taylor. He's here to help you do your jobs better and more efficiently. There are to be many changes. Labor will be much more heavily subdivided. Care for your tools will be left to another less skilled hand. Your job is now only to pour into the mold. You are to use the slack that results from lag in various production times to help out another more junior associate anymore either. Now the foreman retires and sends you all back to your stations. While this stranger takes out pen and paper 
as well as a stopwatch. He watches all of you, writing unseen words and glancing at his timepiece. Frequently, not just your seconds, but your fractions of a second are being counted and measured. In the coming days, he writes less and badgers the workers more, including you. He begins to call forth laborers to perform various tasks for him and instructs them on the exact way in which their tools are to be held their muscles to be moved, their recovery motions to be performed. Failure is met with belligerence and extreme hostility. Dark threats are uttered about job security and family livelihood. Anyone whose times are bad are made to feel vulnerable and small. This goes on for months, until at last in August... You are called forth to perform for this management consultant. He reaches into his pocket and takes out that watch, that damnable timepiece, that fucking tyrannical instrument of gears and gauges that has come to rule you and rob you of all your pride, has made you little better than the wielded hammer or the burning furnace. The words escape your lips reflexively before your mind has time to balance passion and prudence. No. The man in fine clothes cocks his head. What did you say? Attention begins to focus on you. Louder this time, you answer. No. You are not timing me. Your job is threatened. You hold firm. No. Watch. All nearby eyes are upon the situation now. You are dismissed, fired on the spot. Murmurs grow as you remove your apron and replace your tools. Those mutterings turn to open conversation as word spreads across the shop. A shout erupts. Another worker has cast aside his tools and is following you out the door. Two more join him, then three, and that's it. There's a strike. Quote, Dear Sir, The very unsatisfactory conditions which have prevailed in the foundry among the molders for the past week or more reached an acute stage this afternoon when a man was seen to use a stopwatch on one of the molders. This we believe to be the limit of our endurance. It is humiliating to us who have always tried to give to the government the best that was in us. This method is un-American in principle, and we most respectfully request that you have it discontinued at once. End quote. These workers would write. For this particular strike, victory would be swift but limited. The fired worker was reinstated and the Ordnance Department committed itself to investigate new management techniques before implementation. Much of the work done at the arsenal would come to be subdivided into ever smaller tasks, however, and more supervisors would be along to advise management on how best to utilize their human resources, as we might put it in the parlance of our times. In those times, many of us have jobs, At the very least, we've probably had some before, or will in the future. In many of these jobs, you'll receive something like an employee handbook. Perhaps one that details each of the many duties and responsibilities you are obligated to perform as convenience store clerk, or delivery driver, or call center employee, etc. Maybe they'll even have you watch a video that illustrates the one or two best practices for how to handle a given situation or perform a given task, down to the words you are to speak and the motions you are to use. In other more lucrative careers, like various flavors of engineering, information technology, and computer science, software development in particular, you might have seen something like a Gantt chart, illustrating workflows and schedules for a project, If you've ever worked in the production of anything personally, maybe your actions were timed via stopwatch and measured against goal times on a sheet. 
decided upon by some far off consultant or vice president. Perhaps you are Six Sigma certified, even. All of these stem in great part from the efforts of a single man as the century turned from the 19th to the 20th in the United States. In the Second Industrial Revolution, the United States was in full swing. This was a time of advances in steel, rail, electricity, numerous chemicals, and petroleum products. It was also the birth of a brand new discipline that only capitalism with its never-ending hunger for vanquishing inefficiency and maximizing profit, could spawn modern business management. And the first guy to really make a go at it, and what passed for a rigorous and scientific way at the time, and subsequently make it big, was a guy named Frederick Winslow Taylor. Born March 20th, 1856, to upper-class Philadelphians, the son of a Princeton lawyer's original plan was to become a lawyer himself. Allegedly, his eyesight began failing him as a result of excessive study. After his acceptance to Harvard, but before his attendance, though it would return to him within months, his eyesight, that is. So instead of being a lawyer, in 1874, he took a job with some family friends at the Enterprise Hydraulic Works in Philadelphia as an apprentice. So he got six months time off the floor to serve as representative at a New England machine tool exposition. How nice for him. In 1878, his apprenticeship was completed. He moved to another factory operated by yet different family friends. Some things never change, you see. Where he was quickly promoted up through time clerk, journeyman, gang boss, foreman of the whole machine shop, research director, and then finally chief engineer of the whole works in just a few months. Doubtless he was diligent, intelligent, hardworking, but we know, contrary to what the ruling class would have us all believe, such qualities are actually relatively common in the world. Rarer is to have the owner of the factory close friends of yours, and the boss's son married to your sister, as was the case for Frederick Taylor. Anyway, in 1881, at the Midvale Steel Plant, Taylor debuted his most iconic and hated emblem of repression, the stopwatch. With this watch and his own study of motion over time, the filming would come later, Taylor set out to divine, standardize, and then train his workers on the most efficient way to carry out even the most mundane of tasks in each step of the process of manufacturing a finished product. Around this time, the general rule of thumb was about a 90 to 10 production workers to everyone else scale. That is, all the supervisors, clerks, bookkeepers, whatnot, everyone who's not a productive member of the workforce should be capped at around 10% in order to maximize productivity. That was the given wisdom of the day. Taylor discovered that by reducing each step in the manufacturing process to its most basic of units and training workers to perform efficiently and repetitively the same actions in that process over and over again, he could hire more supervisors proportionally, up to 25% of the employees not directly engaged in production, and still substantially increase outputs. In addition, these new slots above and around production labor were sort of plum jobs, to offer the most compliant and talented of his blue-collar workers. He could also substantially immiserate those under his boot. Quote, It is only through enforced standardization of methods, enforced adoption of the best implements and working conditions, and enforced cooperation that this faster work can be assured, and the duty of enforcing the adoption of standards... Enforcing this cooperation rests with management alone. His emphasis. He went on, quote, The idea then of training a workman under a competent teacher into new working habits until he continually and habitually works in accordance with scientific laws, which have been developed by someone else, is directly antagonistic to the old idea that each workman can best regulate his own way of doing the work. A real peach. 
Taylor would go on to manage some paper mills, start his own consulting firm before Bethlehem Steel hired him in 1898 to deal with their shop problems. His own difficult interpersonal style, to put it as neutrally as I can, led to his forcing out just three years later. He never again worked for anyone else other than himself, having also gotten his hands on a few patents for steel manufacturing that made him a very rich man. Taylor was constantly railing against what he called soldiering. That is, workers performing their work like conscripts. You see, when you're working under threat of punishment, perhaps literal gun to your head, if you've been conscripted by an army, or the threat of the lash, or just the abstract threat of starvation and destitution without the compensation of a wage, you tend to work just hard enough to avoid being disciplined, and not a lick harder. This is actually a totally natural inclination, and the smartest one to follow, as staying alive and obedience are both prerequisites to your choice. If you've ever had a job where you were sure as the sun rises in the east every morning that it did not matter in any material way how excellent the work you performed was, and so resigned yourself to work just hard enough not to get fired, a la office space, you know exactly the mentality I mean. The father of modern business management, quote, science, and I can't stress enough the enormous quote I'm putting around the word science, he who loved his time in motion studies down to fractions of a second, was actually a supremely incurious man and a very simple thinker in philosophy. Taylor was a big fan of heavy-handed beast fables when it came to describing workers comparing the difference between a first-class laborer and second-class laborer as the difference between a racehorse for running and a draft horse for hauling loads. He said all this in a congressional hearing he was hauled in front of after the events at the Watertown Arsenal I described at the beginning. And at this point, his incredibly popular philosophy, which had come to be known as scientific management, had also begun to generate backlash, and not just among the people it was afflicted upon. His congressional interlocutor asked him if scientific management has any place for the second-class men. Taylor's answer was, quote, Scientific management has no place for a bird that can sing and won't sing. End quote. He went on like this a bit more before his... Opponent interrupted, quote, We are not in this particular investigation dealing with horses nor singing birds, but we are dealing with men who are a part of society and for whose benefit society is organized, end quote. Taylor was unbowed, quote, There is no place for a man who can work and won't work, end quote, he said. They argued a bit more before Taylor started getting pissed. There is always a job somewhere. For any physically fit man, he insisted. His interlocutor informed him that around 3 to 4 million people then were currently on permanent unemployment in America. He who measured time by the fraction of a second, he who was always equipped with a slide rule, he who took detailed notes on precise motions and tables of productivity and called himself a man of science, admitted he was unfamiliar with those statistics and that this was merely an impression on his part. Naturally, union or collective ownership of an enterprise by the workers is not really possible under such a view as Taylor's, and neither is even collective bargaining. Taylor's world is one in which unions have nothing left to do, stripped of their ability to effectively restrict output with each job simplified and repetitive as near as possible. He would frequently tout the possibility that increased efficiency would come to mean shorter work hours, but obviously never pointed to any evidence of this in any of the shots that had been so-called tailorized, and history has since proven that particular sales fitch for fools. Now, it might be fair to ask why I spend so much time on a villain rather than any hero, 
and I can only answer that his thinking was incredibly influential. And as much crap as I am currently giving him and his biography, his reputation today remains fairly unblemished. At best, cursory and reactive criticisms of the inhumanity of treating humans as machines, points about the limits of work segmentation, and the quickly mentioned rewards in the form of increased wages for productivity that Taylor advocated for are all to be found. But more numerous are passages about the amazing efficiencies of scale and productivity he achieved, the history of the arsenal at Watertown, rewritten as a triumph of Taylorism in the end, with only its edge softened in what would really be a sort of last gasp to preserve some meager dignity and pride in labor, but in what's often couched as a great compromise between American business acumen and labor struggle in the misty days of history. Lots of people still go for the full-on knob slobber. Quote, Darwin, Marx, and Freud make up the trinity, often cited as the makers of the modern world. Marx would be taken out and replaced by Taylor if there were any justice. End quote. Said some fucking Austrian management consultant. Taylor's heavily segmented, enforced, and hierarchical style of management, designed to create automatons to be deployed and managed, rather than humans who deserve to run their own workplace, in my opinion, reminds me of some Marx, who I don't often quote around here, all posing aside. This is not from Das Kapital or anything, but from Economic and Political Manuscripts of 1844. Quote, first, the fact that labor is external to the worker, i.e. it does not belong to his intrinsic nature, that in his work, therefore, he does not affirm himself but denies himself, does not feel content but unhappy, does not develop freely his physical and mental energy but mortifies his body and ruins his mind. The worker, therefore, only feels himself outside his work, and in his work feels outside himself, he feels at home when he is not working, and when he is working he does not feel at home. His labor is therefore not voluntary but coerced. It is forced labor. It is therefore not the satisfaction of a need. It is merely a means to satisfy needs external to it. Its alien character emerges clearly in the fact that as soon as no physical or other compulsion exists, labor is shunned like the plague. External labor, labor in which man alienates himself, is a labor of self-sacrifice, of mortification. Lastly, the external character of labor for the worker appears in the fact that it is not his own, but someone else's. That it does not belong to him, that in it he belongs not to himself, but to another. Just as in religion the spontaneous activity of the human imagination, of the human brain, and the human heart operates on the individual independently of him, that is, operates as an alien, divine or diabolical activity, so is the worker's activity not his spontaneous activity. It belongs to another. It is the loss of his self. End quote. Taylor's ways were also felt across the world by the early 20th century. The United Kingdom, Canada, Switzerland, France all greatly tailorized their plans in a certain number of ways. But it's actually time to introduce his most surprising fan. Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, better known as Lenin, in 1914 a private Russian citizen in Galicia, a crown land of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in present-day Poland and Ukraine, wrote on the eve of World War I in the March of that year, quote, Capitalism cannot be at a standstill for a single moment. It must forever be moving forward. Competition, which is keenest in a period of crisis like the present, calls for the invention of an increasing number of new devices to reduce the cost of production. But the domination of capital converts all these devices into instruments 
for the further exploitation of the workers. The Taylor system is one of these devices. Advocates of this system recently used the following techniques in America. An electric lamp was attached to a worker's arm. The worker's movements were photographed and the movements of the lamp studied. Certain movements were found to be superfluous and the worker was made to avoid them, i.e. to work more intensively without losing a second for rest. The layout of new factory buildings is planned in such a way that not a moment will be lost in delivering materials to the factory and conveying them from one shop to another. And in dispatching the finished products, the cinema is systematically employed for studying the work of the best operatives and increasing its intensity, i.e. speeding up the workers. For example, a mechanic's operations were filmed in the course of a whole day. After studying the mechanic's movements, the efficiency experts provided him with a bench high enough to enable him to avoid losing time in bending down. He was given a boy to assist him. This boy had to hand up each part of the machine in a definite and most efficient way. Within a few days, the mechanic performed the work of assembling the given machine in one-fourth of the time it had taken before. What an enormous gain in labor productivity! But the worker's pay is not increased fourfold, but only half as much again at the very most, and only for a short period at that. As soon as the workers get used to the new system, their pay is cut to the former level. The capitalist obtains an enormous profit, but the workers toil four times as hard as before, and wear down the nerves and muscles four times as fast as before. End quote. You may be thinking, it doesn't sound like he's much of a fan. Well, after obtaining power, Lenin changed his tune dramatically. And in 1918, he's saying this, quote, The Russian is a bad worker who must learn to work. The Taylor system is a combination of the refined brutality of bourgeois exploitation and a number of the greatest scientific achievements in the field of analyzing mechanical motions during work. The elimination of superfluous and awkward motions, the elaboration of correct methods of work, the introduction of the best system of accounting and control, etc. The Soviet Republic must at all costs adopt all that is valuable in the achievements of science and technology in this field. End quote. Stalin himself remarked, quote, The combination of the Russian revolutionary sweep with American efficiency is the essence of Leninism. End quote. And if you ask me, the failures of centrally planned economies of this era have as much or more to do with Taylorism's explicit influence upon the Soviet Union's policymakers' five-year plans as they do anything inherent to leftism. I will close with this. You will probably recognize some of the broad outlines of this story. It's from a novel called We completed by the Russian Yevgeny Zamyatin in 1921. In a futuristic walled-off society, run in a style of scientific management or tailorism, surveillance is all present in nearly every building made of glass. People are not given names, but instead are assigned numbers. They walk in step with each other. Secret police lurk everywhere. Sex partners are assigned, children raised by the state, all intoxicants illegal. Our protagonist meets a woman, different from the rest, who smokes, drinks, and flirts, all forbidden under the laws of what they call one state. The protagonist is both repelled and intrigued, and gradually she reveals to him that she is with the resistance movement. She reveals tunnels to the outside world beyond the wall, where the remaining humans on the planet are covered in fur a thousand years after one state's conquest of their world. And she tells him the plan is to reunite the city with the rest of the planet by bringing down the wall. At the conclusion of the novel, the protagonist has been subjected to something called the Great Operation, recently mandated for all citizens of one state psychosurgically enhanced into a state of mechanical reliability, now truly fleshly automatons. He tells the state everything he knows about the resistance. 
The protagonist expresses hope that the state will prevail. But parts of the wall have been destroyed, birds are coming back to the city, and people have begun committing acts of rebellion. We was banned in Lenin's Russia until 1924. George Orwell read We in a French translation and reviewed it. Eight months later, he began work on 1984. And in some ways, it all started with the first prick to create an entire discipline that embraced the mechanization of humanity while we all wait around for actual robots to come along. Thank you for listening. See you next time. Uh, Patreon.com slash Disappeasant. Consider checking it out. Alright. Bye-bye.